This is Lauren Klafke interviewing Dr. J. David Richardson at the 103rd Clinical Congress of the American College of Surgeons in San Diego, California. It's October 23rd, 2017. Dr. Richardson is a professor of surgery and vice chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Kentucky. He became fellow of the American College of Surgeons in 1980 and served in many leadership positions within the Kentucky, Kentucky chapter and at the top levels of the organization, including serving as president from 2015 to 2016. Thank you for meeting today, Dr. Richardson. It's my pleasure. Okay. So to get started, I wanted to ask you what prompted your interest in medicine and specifically surgery. I um, grew up early, I think. I grew up in eastern Kentucky and in a time when um, people made decisions early. People got married young, but uh, you were expected to be out on your own by the time you finished high school. So I decided when I was a senior in high school uh, that I was going to go to medical school. I had no medical family background. My father went to the eighth grade, my mother high school graduate. Uh, both of them were very bright people, but uh, grew up in a very rural background. And, and, uh, and even though we had a state university uh, in our town, that was not really much of an option for my father when he grew up. Uh, so I would made my own decision between uh, when I was a, during the Christmas break when I was a senior in high school. I got down to law and medicine and I figured, to quote Shakespeare, you know, first kill all the lawyers, I, mean, I shouldn't <laughs> say that, but, but uh, I, I thought, you know, we probably, and we didn't have very many lawyers then, but still had probably too many, mm -hmm. and we didn't have enough physicians. So my plan really was to go into uh, to probably family practice and go back to my hometown was my was my thought at the time. A very you know, I, but I always thought that you know you sometimes let the stream carry you where it's going to. And uh, I got a job before I started in medical school, um, working in a surgical laboratory mainly because I wanted to make a little money uh, before I started school. And I sort of got hooked doing that very quickly. Uh, that was the days when there was a fair bit of animal surgery that went on uh, using various models. I got very involved in, in doing uh, trauma and shock work. Uh, the Vietnam War was going on and uh, how, to, how to do proper resuscitation for combat casualties was a major topic. And so uh, I worked in an extraordinarily productive lab and had probably at least a dozen publications by the time I finished medical school uh, so that um, uh, I, I never really, once I did that summer, I never really contemplated doing anything but, but surgery, truthfully. Uh, which I'd have totally ruled out along with psychiatry before I did that summer experience. I, I mean, seriously, I, yeah. I had no thought about being a surgeon and, or a psychiatrist. I thought, no, those are two I won't do. Mm -hmm. But that experience, in, the, in Kentucky in those days was an extraordinarily dynamic school. It was a young school. Dr. Frank Spencer was there, who's been past president of the college. Uh, Dr. Ben Eisman, now, now deceased, who was a very influential leader in American surgery. And uh, Dr. Ward Griffin, uh, who was uh, later uh, the executive director of the American Board of Surgery. So it was an extremely vibrant uh, young department, and, and, uh, and uh, I caught the surgery bug pretty hard. The, the doctors you just mentioned, were these mentors for you in medical school, or just? Yeah, I mean, I wrote, I, I had actually, it's, it's interesting, for a small state school that I went to, um, I tried to be very well educated. Uh, so I had a major in history. I had enough hours to be a, have an English major, mm. but you had to take a course in English education uh, and I knew I wasn't going to teach English, so I didn't do that. Otherwise, I'd have had an English, could have had an English minor. I'd, but I took courses in Shakespeare, creative mm -hmm. writing, a variety of things. And actually, I'd won a national, I'd, I'd won an award uh, presented by the National Council of Teachers of English uh, when I was a senior medical or senior high school student. So I thought I wrote pretty well. But one of my favorite Dr. Heisman stories is I'd written. A paper we were doing perfusion of, of, of pig livers uh, for transplantation and which later became Eisman had the notion that you could eventually do liver transplants long before anyone ever really did them so he said if we do that how are we going to preserve the liver 
So we were working on, on various preservation techniques using a perfusion mechanism with various solutions mm -hmm. put in through the artery and vein, uh, or well, actually put in through the artery of, 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 of the pig liver. And so I was fairly proud of the work and I got it back and it was just, I couldn't see the paper for all the red that he'd marked on it. And, <laughs> and so I, I started negotiating with him and about keeping certain sentences and paragraphs and phrases in and he let me do a couple of those and then he put his hand down very firmly and he says, Dave, these are not your children. These words are not your children. He said, get rid of some of them. And so he, he had a very Hemingway-esque kind of style to the way he wrote and liked to people to write and I was a bit too flowery for that. I, so, uh, so I mean, I had, uh, I had a lot of counseling about things and, but mentoring wasn't, it wasn't the buddy system kind of thing like it is now. You, you basically saw what people did and I think tried to emulate and pick and choose the parts of it you didn't like uh, and whatnot. So this is the way I did. And, and uh, uh, so I had a lot of great surgical teachers and, and, and people that teach you different kinds of things. I had some people who, uh, frankly, I would have never let operate on me or my family as, as yeah. surgical attendants, mm -hmm. truthfully. Uh, but I learned things from them in different different ways. Perhaps sometimes just about life, not not necessarily about surgery even. And and uh, so I, I think um, uh, to me, mentoring comes in, in so many different forms. It's become rather a hackneyed kind of phrase. I think everybody talks now about mm -hmm. mentoring, and I don't know. Sometimes I think it's overworked a bit. And uh, I would truly say I never had any one one mentor or person that really tried to guide my path in any way, but, but I was a fairly headstrong young man and, okay. and I just sort of tried to pick and choose different, different things and learn from, from a variety of people okay. and, uh, and uh, very grateful to those along the way that, who, who, to whom I owe a debt because I learned something from them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had mentioned uh, trauma being very important in your training, uh, particularly in the Vietnam era, mm -hmm. and I didn't know if you ended up doing service through the Berry Plan um, in terms of physicians? And no, I actually, it was very interesting. I joined the Kentucky Air National Guard. Oh. And in those days, it's not on my CV because I actually got kicked out of the Guard, which is sort of an interesting story, I guess, in of <laughs> itself. I'd been, I've had some back issues all my life and mm -hmm. subsequently had a bunch of back operations, but I was having a lot of back pain. Mm -hmm. And I was diagnosed with an arterial venous malformation of the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not that's actually point of fact, I, I, I don't know because once we got to the MRI era, that's never shown up. Mm -hmm. But I had a work work up for that. And when I joined the guard, one of the questions you asked is, "Have you been in the hospital in the past 12 months?" And I answered, "No." Mm -hmm. And I had been. I'd been in for a few days having a myelogram. Mm -hmm. I'd had what they thought was a, was a spinal cord bleed. Mm -hmm. And I was advised to switch to something sedentary and don't go into surgery and, you know, because wow. you might be paralyzed and you ought to do something you might do in a wheelchair and all that stuff. And I thought, well, I mean, I understood that could happen, but I thought if it did, then I'd make a career transition. Wow. I wasn't going, to, wasn't going to do it at that point in time. So I joined the guard. Uh, and we jumped out of, I was a flight surgeon, and I'd been in quite a while, and then, of course, um, one day I get this letter that I had falsified an application. Oh. You know, from the, oh, holy cow. You know, that I'd falsified an application because you were in point of fact where, so once they, they had looked at, you know, the notion, that I might get called up and become paralyzed and them have to take care of me. They decided they didn't need me. <laughs> so then I became 1A, but never got drafted. I, and I thought it was interesting. I can't go in the guard, mm -hmm. but I can be drafted. But, yeah. but I ended up not, not being drafted and, and whatnot. I never considered the Barry plan. I, okay. I just never did. I thought, no. And at the time, it's interesting now because people look at the people in the guard like, oh, you know, yeah the yellow berets or something, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the time, my mother nearly died, and, and, and I was married. My wife said, why are you doing this? I said, well, I'd rather go serve two years and maybe do something productive mm -hmm. uh, and, and being a flight surgeon than being a general medical officer in some you know, remote base or something, you know. Mm -hmm. I thought, so I'd rather 
take my chances on doing something that, that maybe I had some skills in doing, might actually even learn something from. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, didn't com I didn't complete that service. I, I did less than a year and had to res resign my commission, and which is, I mean, it was an embarrassment at the time because I certainly, I would, I would have never intentionally falsified anything. I just, mm -hmm. first of all, just forgot about it. And yeah. they were drafting people with one eye and one kidney and all kinds of things, but for wow. physicians. So the thought that, I didn't even give that a thought, but right. that's the way it was. Right. Well, after you completed medical school, you did your residency at the UT Health Science Center at Spent Center. two years in Kentucky, where I went to medical okay. school. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then, um, I, that was still there when people moved around a bit, which mm -hmm. is very, now if you move around, it's usually because for a reason, mm -hmm. you know, either, Usually it's because you're asked to move around, frankly, today. Mm -hmm. um, unless there's some, occasionally there's a personal issue or some reason to move, but, but that's pretty uncommon today. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, it was not all that uncommon. And um, the problem was Kentucky at that time had a pyramidal system where they truncated down from, you know, eight or ten residents to four. Oh. And... Uh, and we had people going to Vietnam, coming from Vietnam. I mean, the whole the whole system was in turmoil, and that's why I do. This is a, is an old man statement, and and I'll I'll admit it as such going in. I do get bemused, maybe would be a proper way to say it, when I hear about stress and safe place and how hard we have it today, and and all those kinds of things because. I mean, think about it. You didn't know if you were going to get drafted. You didn't know if your guard unit was going to get called up. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't know what your future was going to be, where you were going to be next year until a few months before it happened to you. And, and, or, and so, so incredibly, or am I going to have a job next year in a, in a pyramidal system? And the pyramidal systems have all gone away in, in American training for, for the better, thank mm -hmm. goodness. But I, I had a personal thing. Uh, is it all right to tell a personal story? Yes, certainly. My wife had a stillborn child at eight months. Oh, wow. And um, it was an extraordinarily difficult time for her. And I was not a very good husband, uh, and I knew it at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I mean, uh, she was disconsolate with grief. Mm -hmm. I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say things like we can have another child, and but she'd already had a couple of early miscarriages, uh, mm -hmm. um, and you know I was working very hard, really hard. Those I called every other night, and and yes, then yes, yes. and then the mantra was, well, boy, that's a terrible system because you miss half the good cases. Mm. So it was a totally different time. Mm -hmm. And hundred-hour work weeks were light weeks, um, and on the other hand, the learning curve for that was incredible. So, for a variety of reasons, I had an opportunity to go to Texas, and and uh, and a man by the name of Kent Trinkle, uh, who was uh, a person I'd done some lab work with, was going to head up a, start up a cardiac surgery program mm. in San Antonio. Mm. And I, the thought was that I'd finish training in, in Kentucky and then go with him. And then when this happened, I thought, you know, maybe it'd be a good time to just, maybe a change of scenery would be good. I'd mm -hmm. been gone to medical school there. I'd worked in the lab for a long time and thought maybe it'd be good to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So we just made it. Wasn't that I thought Texas was better than Kentucky. I was just different. Mm -hmm. And it was a good move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you find the cultures of the places to be very different in very terms of different. medicine? Mm -hmm. Very different. What, what kinds of differences did you notice or that still? Well, a lot of it was the patients. Um, Lexington, Kentucky was a smaller, they were neither terribly huge. San Antonio is a huge city now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was about 250,000 there, very Hispanic mm -hmm. in, in terms of, of cultural influences. Mm -hmm. um, um, Kentucky, the patients were by and large like me. They were um, country people. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town, and mm -hmm. I could certainly relate to those patients very well, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, speak the language. 
and whatnot. I tried to learn medical Spanish in San Antonio. Mm. Got pretty good at that, but mm -hmm. but conversational Spanish was very hard. Mm -hmm. But most of our patients, the, the predominance at that time spoke Spanish. Okay. And so culturally it was very different. And San Antonio at the time was having a lot of drug drug problems. Oh, okay. And so the much more violence and much more penetrating trauma than we would ever see in a, in a town like Lexington, which was fairly sedate, still mm -hmm. still is really. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so patient, patient volumes were different. San Antonio, uh, Hispanic patients, especially with an with a admixture of, of, of Native American blood, mm -hmm. which a lot of people in South Texas had, mm -hmm. in gallbladder disease was endemic, so huge mm -hmm. practice in biliary disease. What about the um, physicians you were working with? Any, any differences you noticed in terms of culture? They were all trained in Minnesota. Really? In both places, or so many of them were, wow. which was a breeding ground, if you will, for, mm -hmm. for surgical chiefs at the time. Mm -hmm. So the philosophy was very different and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and whatnot in many ways. But uh, I, I liked the training, and it was, it was very good. And, and I never intended to do cardiac surgery mm -hmm. or heart surgery, but, but always wanted to do non-thoracic, you know, lung cancer and those kind of things. And I did that throughout my practice. Okay. Um, and then when you... What spurred your return to Kentucky? I'm a Kentuckian. <laughs> okay. I'm a hillbilly through and through. I like horses. I love horses. Mm -hmm. um, and I love basketball. And those are in her blood. <laughs> and I wanted my family, we had two children at the time. We'd adopted a child mm -hmm. uh, who was an abandoned child, and my wife and I adopted her. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we'd had a child of our own in Texas. And I wanted to be raised. My grand, my parents were alive and fairly young, uh, and I, as my wife's parents were also alive at the time, and uh, so I wanted to be raised around cousins. My wife was one of eleven children. Oh wow! So I wanted to be raised as a part of that culture. Our families, the Richardsons, have been in Kentucky since the second wave of Daniel Boone before Kentucky was a state. And, I I love Kentucky. It's we've got a lot of flaws in our state, but it's a beautiful state and mm -hmm. a lot of good, generous people there and even a lot of we have a lot of poor people and a lot of people with very simple values, but but by and large very good people and, and so I never left. Is the Kentucky Tourism Board giving you some <laughs> payments for this well, one? Well they, they should actually. <laughs> I've I've thought they should. <laughs> But I've actually, I actually have worked with our tourism board. I've been trying to get, oh, really? to, been trying to get some college activities to come to Louisville. So oh, Louisville's okay. a very undervalued city, in my opinion. Okay. Great food city. It's it's good. Uh, so, when were you recruited back to Kentucky by someone you knew, or the position opened up and you applied? Well, they didn't want me to leave Lexington at the time. Okay. And so coming back there was not an option. Mm -hmm. I. To, to the to the university, mm -hmm. frankly, uh, I had to do a little fence mending and whatnot, and some of that's a personal issue that I got myself. I was in a fairly impetuous, headstrong young man. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's hard to believe, but it's, <laughs> it's somewhat true. And so I um, I had the opportunity. I like to work with residents, and and frankly, the, the job it was a horrible job. It was, just a terrible job, but mm -hmm. but it was the opportunity to build a practice, to build something, and to be a part of. We had a fairly young chair at the time, uh, named Hiram Polk, who was chair for for many years, and uh, so uh, it was the opportunity to build something, and and because we were a very small cadre of faculty at the time, and and uh, it was a, it was a very good opportunity. I wanted the opportunity to see. I wanted the opportunity to have patients of my own which many universities at the time didn't really, they were more clinic-based kinds of things. And mm -hmm. I wanted, to, I wanted to, to operate and take care of patients that were mine and where I was their doctor, not, not university hospital or, or some clinic doctor or somebody they didn't really know their name or if mm -hmm. they did, they forgot it. Mm -hmm. so. Do you think, you mentioned that you were impetuous, do you think that that helped you in pushing forward in your career or is that a quality you think is something that impacted your pursuit of surgery and moving forward in that or yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse for better or for worse <laughs> yeah I you know you want to make an omelet you know mm -hmm. 
kind of kind of guy sometimes. <laughs> and 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 I that's not always a good fit. I mean, you got to pick your spots. Mm -hmm. And and I've tried to do that, but but I've been. I mean, I've at times shaken things up in different kinds of situations mm -hmm. when perhaps a, a better judgment might have been not to. Mm. Perhaps I don't know. Mm -hmm. But to me, one of the things that bothers me about organizations, and I'm speaking generically, mm -hmm. is this this thing where people on a board sort of do this, you know, they let's yes. see, you know, which way's the wind blowing? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I think this is so I'd agree with old Joe. Yeah, Betty's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hank's got a good point there. I mean, what good is that? I mean, you know, tell me what does that tell you? I mean ever <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't, I have very contrary views on most things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, a, I mean, and it's not that I try to be contrary. I just learned a long time ago that prevailing wisdom's often wrong, totally wrong. Mm. And so I believe if I've seen something or I have things or, um, you know, that, that, and a lot of times that people just make you think you're stupid. I mean, I have very different views on global warming, as mm -hmm. an example. I've actually read some climate journals. I don't understand them at all. Mm -hmm. But when I get into some of the math and all that, I, I, I'm smart enough, I think, to say, well, if you just change one factor, one coefficient, one this, one that, mm -hmm. the whole model changes. Mm -hmm. And I also know that if you want to get funding for something, the, you know how you do that? You scare the hell out of people. Mm. You know, Oceans are going to rise. New York City is going to be flooded. Mm -hmm. I'm confident the earth has warmed and cooled for millions of years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely confident. So do I think we have global climate change? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do I think we've had that forever? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do I think man causes it? Some of it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And so we probably ought to fix that. But to say that this is some kind, I mean, to me, that's like the zombie apocalypse or something. I mean, you know, it just, I think that gets way overblown, just like so many other things that, that we've have come and gone, and, mm -hmm. and there's a whole fear industry in the world, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it. Well, to me, you live day to day. You plan for your future the best you can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but but when I say that to people, to, oh, I mean, they just look at me like I'm the dumbest Luddite hypocrite that ever lived. Just so <laughs> stupid. How could you not? Everybody believes that. How could you not believe it? Well, I'm, a lot of things I don't believe that everybody else believes. Yeah, yeah. But actually, I've when I was a resident, uh -huh. You treated, a, there was an entity called flail chest, mm -hmm. still an entity, mm -hmm. where people get hurt and they break ribs. And, and their ribs then, because they're broken in several places, sort of float up and down independent of, mm -hmm. of um, the way the chest moves. And so when I was a resident, that disease, that condition had a very high mortality. Because what people were doing was treating it in a way, they called it internal pneumatic stabilization. Mm -hmm. So they put people on big ventilators and they blow the lungs out to get the chest till it healed in that position. Well, the problem was that you get pneumonia from being on a ventilator, you could get all, you know, get all kinds of problems that were really man-made, iatrogenic kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And so I went into Trinkle, I attended, who's now in Texas, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I said, these people are crazy. I said, that's a stupid. I mean, and I tend to be, to me, if you want to make a point, sometimes you'd be hyperbolic about it. Okay. You know, it's, you know. Also blunt. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm very plain spoken. Yeah. yeah. And that's either my worst feature or my best, depending on your point of view. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I told him. I said, this is dumb. I said, this makes no sense. And I said, because we had operated on a patient who had a, a, an entity called a chondrosarcoma of the sternum. Mm hmm and we'd done a big resection of this thing, and we'd put some mesh in and some stuff. But his, he was just flailing away, and he was breathing fine. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if he can do this, then why do we? And so what we came to was the notion that what was really problematic was that they had an underlying contusion of the lung. Mm -hmm. And and so let's, let's see if we can figure out how to treat the pulmonary contusion. Let's just quit worrying about the flail. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And... And I'd say as a resident, that was my idea to do that. Mm -hmm. And we changed the treatment of flail chest within a year. Wow. And it's, now people have forgotten that now because nobody reads past four or five years because that's what you can find on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, 
So at any rate, but in the 1970s, we totally changed and, and got flail chest mortality down from 30 to 40 percent to one percent maybe or so. That's amazing. It, I mean, it, yeah. you know, it's just by being headstrong and hyperbolic and yeah. questioning things. And so, so I've questioned a lot of common wisdom all my life. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just stuff doesn't make sense to me. It's not part of my experience. Then you got to be careful about that because maybe your experience is just your experience and right, not right. others. I mean, I got that. But, mm -hmm. but if you've got a pretty broad experience in things, then maybe you're right and everybody else is wrong. Mm -hmm. So in 1980, you became a fellow at the American College of Surgeons. Do you have any specific memories from early meetings or your early experience that you would like to share? <laughs> well, well, the very first one, I was, in, I was abducted in Atlanta mm -hmm. and in the first meeting, uh, it did seem like we droned on a long time at the meeting. I, I don't know that that's true, but my recollection was. So halfway through the convocation, somebody pitched off, and this was one of these great big high dioceses. I mean, this thing was really high. Uh -huh. and, and it was in some convention center. I don't know where it was held, but it was in some fairly big place. And you know, so you're on this big old stage, and we're all sitting down there listening, and all of a sudden, we just saw this guy go pitching off the back of the thing, and you could hear it's like a watermelon hitting a, you know, dropping out of a four-story building when he hit the ground, <laughs> chair and all. Oh my and so the, the, the show went right on. They did not stop. <laughs> Nobody went to see about him up from the stage. Everybody just kept looking. A few people sort of looked around. And uh, I know that's a horrible <laughs> record. I don't remember anything else about my convocation. I don't remember who the speaker was, what he talked about. I have no recollection except that poor guy falling off the back of the dais. And then people from the audience, including two or three of the initiates, I was far back. I was so far back I couldn't go help him. Uh -huh. but they'd run up and helped him. They brought they brought a stretcher in and carried him out on it. And the show went right on. <laughs> Nobody stopped to check to look and see if he was okay. Yeah. So I never didn't know what happened to him. I don't know who it was, but I, that was my that was, that was my one recollection. That was not uh, so the answer not I expected. I, I was not. I wish I could tell you that I was inspired by the address. <laughs> all. I have no recollection of any of it. I need to go look it up and see who the speaker was, what right. the subject was. I wish I had looked it up. <laughs> but, but no, that was it. So. Um, but in those days, <laughs> my, very, my first week at practice, uh, this was a long-haired generation. Now, I never mm -hmm. had what I thought was long hair. Mm -hmm. Looking at, back at it, it was, I mean, you know, I didn't have a mullet or a big long, I didn't have Beatles-style haircuts mm -hmm. ever. But I did have some button chop sideburns <laughs> and, and, you know, some hair down over my ears. Mm -hmm. and I actually, my hair would still be black, but I dye it gray for effect, you know. But, but at any <laughs> rate, I, uh, so I had fairly black hair, and and the place where I worked, uh, I worked at the university, but but it was tasked with building a private service at a place called Norton Hospital, which mm -hmm. is across the street from our university. And it was a very sort of a white bread kind of hospital, rich mm -hmm. people by and large in those days, and uh, it was where it was where if you're going to stay in Louisville and get care and you're affluent, that's generally where you got care. Mm -hmm. And so I was v certainly very different looking than, than all, that was younger than all the other attendings. They were very senior and, and, uh, and whatnot. But I remember in my first week in practice, I got sent a, a patient who had a, who had a thyroid lump and uh, I don't know, well, I do know how she came to me. I'd met one of the obstetricians who was young and starting out and, He'd examined her doing just a routine exam and noticed this lump in her throat. Mm -hmm. And her husband was a trial attorney. Mm -hmm. And so he asked me, he said, are you a fellow of the American College of Surgeons? And I said, no. And he said, well, come on, let's go. Let's get out of here if you're not a fellow of the college. And I said, well, actually, you have to be in practice three years to be a fellow. And I said, so I'm not. Yeah. So he started about my experience and commented on my hair. And, <laughs> and right at the, he then let me take his wife's thyroid out eventually, and uh -huh. she did fine, thank goodness, and I didn't get sued. <laughs> but, it, but it demonstrated to me, first week in practice, how some people looked at FACS yeah. and, uh, and whatnot. And then I was, even though I had a fairly active elective practice, I, um, I was always very interested in care of the injured. I just thought that was something very important. Because 
you know, if you think about it, if you're hurt, you don't get to choose. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't get to choose anything, really, mm -hmm. frankly. And so I always thought it's really important to have skilled people doing that as well and committed people. And, and uh, so for years I did, I'd do day work and then I'd do night work. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, it's a different time. But, mm -hmm. uh, but so taking care of the injured and trauma patients is always a big part of what I did, even though I had a big elective practice. Mm -hmm. And I thought the two complemented each other very well because both allowed you to develop your skills in, in different kinds of ways. And, and uh, if you don't operate a lot during the day, it's very hard to take care of really hard problems at night if that's the first time you've been in the OR for a few weeks sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's a, a thing I've preached throughout, uh, throughout my career is trauma surgeons need to operate. They need mm -hmm. to have a practice. And frankly, a lot of that became the genesis of what now is, could be called acute care surgery, really. Mm. So, so the college was always important, I guess. Okay. I mean, in my, in my thinking. I mean, to me, that's what you did. You joined the college. Okay. Did you have many friends in the college as well? Any mentors within the college? I, I know we're throwing around the word mentorship again, but... No, no, not um, really. Not okay. really. I, uh, I'm a joiner. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's my nature. Mm -hmm. I like people. I like to... Again, networking is overworked now. I, didn't, mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't thought of in that regard. I just, just to me, I, that's what you did. And if you, if you do something, I'm, I'm a, sort of a, what's the milk balls to the wall, full tilt boogie. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I go, I tend to go all in when mm -hmm. I do things. I mean, that's just the way I do stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got very active in the college. And, mm -hmm. and what I, I was before this was at a lunch for residents, and they were asking about it. I said, well, the big thing to do is get started locally, because, mm -hmm. uh, so within a couple of years, I was the secretary of our chapter, and, right, right. and president of our chapter, and then became a governor, and mm -hmm. whatnot, and then was very interested in Committee on Trauma for Kentucky, and then the national, was part of the national COT, and mm -hmm. he was actually vice chair of the Committee on Trauma at one time as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, So you started out as then secretary of uh, the Kentucky chapter. Mm -hmm. Did uh, what kind of issues do you recall facing in the chapter at that time, or uh, did you have anything specific that you were hoping to work on as a member of the chapter, as a leader in the chapter in Kentucky? Yeah, I. It would be a modest but true. Uh, the chapter was never healthier than when I was the secretary. Okay. And the reason was that what people had done was invited present, you know, a lot of resident presentations from the, one of the two medical schools, mm -hmm. and those, which are fine. That's a good, it's a good avenue to do that. Mm -hmm. But what I did was invite presentations, particularly from people of practice. Mm. And so I quickly learned who knew what. So, for example, there was a neurosurgeon who was a fellow of the college but never been to a meeting. Mm. And he did a, uh, he did a bunch of cervical discectomies for cervical, for cervical disc disease. And he'd done, I'd just heard that he'd done hundreds of those over, over you know, the course of a career. He did, was the, sort of the go-to person in town to do that. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, uh, you know, because that's, that's a bit of a surgical disease sometimes because you're you know, you're bending down, it's, you're putting a lot of stress on your neck and on, on your vertebral column. Mm -hmm. So I asked him to come and give a paper on, uh, on, um, on that. And he put his cases together and did. And so I would, I would get, I mean, I would actively recruit people to do it. We had big, robust programs, especially involving the specialties. If you, if you just leave it to people to do things on their own, they often don't. Mm -hmm. If you ask people and engage them, I found that's been a very helpful strategy. I've done grand rounds. I've planned our grand rounds at Louisville for 40 years. <laughs> and, and the same thing, I, if, you, if you ask people, engage people, uh, and say, would you, would you, and I'm talking about often people in practice, not, not just academic people, mm -hmm. would you come and give us a talk on this and your experience? What, what, what did you do in rural surgery last year? What, what are the problems at grand rounds of this a few months ago? Well, the, what are your issues in rural surgery in Kentucky? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this person does a lot of thyroidectomies. What, you know, 
come and tell us your experience and, and give us a talk on it, but also your experience. And, and uh, so but that engages people and, 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 and it, it, it also, I think, gives them value. And, and it shows that, that the college is interested in them. That neurosurgeon eventually became president of our chapter, oh. having never attended a meeting ever. Wow. He said, you know, this isn't half bad. I really <laughs> should do. And it wasn't that he was learning any neurosurgery. I mean, because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I mean? It just, it was, he sort of enjoyed the networking and camaraderie, which he'd never been exposed to in the mm -hmm. past. Do you, did you feel like you were intentionally trying to bridge a gap between the academic and the practice? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, see, the job I was tasked with, I had two, two tasks I was supposed to work on. And one was to try to build a practice at this private hospital. Mm -hmm. And our average daily census was three. Wow. In general surgery. Wow. And my predecessor said, you know, Dave, I thought you were smart. <laughs> he said, you're the dumbest guy I ever saw in my life. If you think you can crack this private practice network, you are crazy. This will never work. You're going to fail miserably and whatnot. But that had been his attitude the whole way. Mm -hmm. So... Mine was, let's make this win-win. Mm -hmm. So I'd been there a few months. I met with administration. I was very helpful. They wanted some changes made and things. Every change they wanted, I accommodated mm -hmm. and made our residents accommodate and convince them of the wisdom of, of accommodation. Mm -hmm. And so I pointed out to the hospital, I said, the day will come when this hospital will fail. Uh, you will fail, uh, and the hospital will fail. Mm -hmm. You're a downtown hospital. Um, hospitals will eventually be built in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Very true. Mm -hmm. It sure happened in Louisville. It's happened everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be training better and better surgeons all the time. So the notion that these community surgeons that you have, they're good people. They may do fine. There were a couple who weren't very good, frankly, but that's a different story. There were several very good. But the notion that 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 this is going to keep your hospital alive is, is fool's gold, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. you, you're not cutting edge in surgery. You don't have really top young surgeons who are going to take you to the level that you want to be. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to partner with the university. You're not going to be, we can find those people, but you've got to help us accrue the patients. Mm -hmm. They, I think, saw the wisdom of that. I was a Kentuckian. Mm -hmm. I had a several classmates who were in primary care in town. I worked that, and I worked hard at practice building. Uh, I went to more little small towns than you can believe, attended, you know, rubber chicken dinners, you know, and their <laughs> medical staff meeting, often with six people there, you know, who were gonna rail on about how bad the university was, and you just sit and take the blows, and you know, but, but some of those people would eventually send you a patient, and, and if you do a good job, you communicate well, mm -hmm. treat your patients well, um, you know, throw enough stuff at the wall, some of it sticks, you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm a Bible scholar, too, you know, the parable of the sower. The sower, uh, yes. You know? Yeah, but you, you, should, you should discuss it for the No, you got to, you got to <laughs> throw a lot of seeds out there. Yeah. Some of them will land on rock and will not grow. Some will land on fallow ground and, mm -hmm. but some will land on fertile ground and will grow. And so you got to throw a lot of seeds out there. And, mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's always, I mean, you just, Nothing works all the time, and, and all, but uh, and if something doesn't work, then, then fine. But but in terms of practice building, um, what doesn't work is just well, I'm great. Then I'll let patients come to me. You know, <laughs> it's my birthright. You know, mm -hmm. let, them, let me have them. And that too often now is I think what people look at. Well, I'm the specialist here. Well, this 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 is mine, mm -hmm. and and whatnot. The other thing is that with patients, uh, one thing about being broadly educated, and I don't—I mean, by, by broadly educated, I mean in a, in, a, in some in a cultural sense too—is, uh, I mean, if I have patients, I can talk basketball pretty well, sports pretty well with mm -hmm. people. Um, I can talk about their pets. <laughs> I would always in 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 my dictation. I would dictate personal notes mm -hmm. uh, to people, mm. uh, about people rather. Mm -hmm. um, their dog died. Oh. 
-hmm. Got a new puppy. Mm -hmm. My daughter's getting married. Mm -hmm. Her dad died. You know, things happen to people. Mm -hmm. and, and so when they come back for their annual checkup, maybe a year later or whatever, um, how's the new puppy doing? Mm -hmm. You know, how's your daughter? You like your son-in-law, you know? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm sorry about your dad. How, how's that going? I mean, and it's not that, I mean, it wasn't phony. I mean, it mm -hmm. wasn't a trick. You know, it's part of caring about people and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, that personal uh, touch can mean a lot. No, it means, it means, it means so much. Mm -hmm. The other thing, see, the other thing I learned a long time ago is that uh, most surgeons don't know anything about getting over an operation. I've been through a lot. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of. You lot mean of operation on themselves? Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, they don't. I mean, you know, I hear people say things like, "Well, you'll feel better every day." No, well, you'll you'll feel better every day. Mm -hmm. Well, do you feel better every day? <laughs> did you feel better? Did, did you feel better today than you did yesterday? Mm -hmm. And will feel better tomorrow than you do today? Or I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Who would say that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's silly. I mean, so what I talk about is that there's a stuttering progression to wellness. You know. It's three steps forward and two back sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and patients get confused if they think they're supposed to feel better every day. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably, you know. But if you tell them what you do is you gauge your progress Friday to Friday. So what did I do this week? How was I done this week as mm -hmm. opposed to the week before? Mm -hmm. And if you do things like that, the other thing I never did is I never abandoned a dying patient. Do you find that happens often? All or, the time. Or, okay. All the time. Hospice. Mm. I'm not a problem with hospice. Mm -hmm. Medical oncology. Well, I, I mean, my, my partners do this. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, look, I can't. I'll just be here for you. I don't know how this is. I mean, I don't know how. Somebody's got cancer. I don't know how it's going to play out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know? But I'll be here for you. Here's my phone number. Call me at home if you want. Mm -hmm. You don't see much of that anymore. No. Here's my cell phone. Call me. In, in terms of what you had mentioned about uh, attending a lot of rubber chicken dinners mm -hmm. and meeting with doctors in uh, more rural areas, I noticed that there's a significant theme in your career about uh, trying to bring attention to the need for uh, rural surgeons, mm -hmm. general surgeons in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you knew just growing up in Kentucky or that occurred, that came, became more clear to you as you were meeting with these physicians or? Always knew that. Always knew, okay. I mean, we didn't have a hospital in, in my hometown until I was a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I had an appendectomy at age 10, I rode in the pre-interstate highway days in the back of a pickup truck, not the litter of the cab, they just, this was, old, it was a two-seater pickup, <laughs> thank God. But that's what they stuck me in, put, threw a blanket over me, drove to Lexington, took two and a half hours in those days. Mm -hmm. And I had a ruptured appendix and, you know, sick, felt terrible. I thought, yeah. you know, it's wrong. I mean, it's wrong. Right. And so, so, I, I, I have been blessed to be president, to have been president of several organizations. I've, I've, mm -hmm. That's been a real blessing. And to me, I never tried to, to, to get any of them, including the presidents of the college. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was thrilled to death. I mean, that's, a, it's, that's, a, that's an incredible honor. Mm -hmm. I really want to be chair of the regents of the college. Mm. That's the one thing in my career I really wanted to do mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't understand the president's really in a more honorific in many mm, ways, truthfully. Mm -hmm. The policy making group of the regents and the chair of the regents really determines a lot of where you're going to go. Mm. So I only got a year shot at it. Mm -hmm. But very first day, as when I was chair of the regents, I said, we're going to do the meetings totally differently. Okay. Again, omelet making. Mm -hmm. I hate the way we're doing meetings. Mm -hmm. I think this is totally worthless. I despise these meetings. I was very, again, <laughs> but if you want to make a point, you don't say, geez, I'm not sure that we're doing these meetings right. No, that's, I mean, if you really want to make a point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes you've you got to make the point. 
-hmm. And so I said, these, so I make it, these are, these are stupid the way we do this. Mm -hmm. we, we give these reports and everybody gets up and glorifies themselves and their divisions and pats themselves on the back. And so we will have no more of that in one, one year. So one person tried to do that. And after five minutes, I I'd, I'd warned him. I said, I'd, I asked him to sit down, actually. Oh, I wow. said, this was not the, you know, we're, we're going to talk about things we need to fix in your division, not how great your division is. Mm. So I had two men come in, a guy named Tyler Hughes, mm -hmm. uh, who now has been very active in, in a whole variety of things with the college, who I had met because I had breakfast with a group of rural surgeons in San Francisco and bought about 18 people breakfast one day mm -hmm. and listened to their things because they had no voice within the college, frankly. Mm -hmm. And another was named Phil Carapresso, who's, I think, going to be our second vice president next year. And um, Phil was from Keokuk, Iowa, and, and Tyler was from uh, McPherson, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And they were very active within this group. It was sort of a rump group. It wasn't had no official status. So when they told their story, it literally made you tear up about the things that they did or did on behalf of their patients. And they're really their love for the college, but they didn't really have a home. So we got the first new advisory council for rural surgery mm -hmm. in 50 years or so, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of the first new advisory council. Mm -hmm. Now, has that fixed rural surgery? No, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. But has at least begun to shine a light on it within the college, has at least given people a voice to say, you know, people care about us. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I personally think the college has not been politically active enough on the issue of rural surgery. Mm -hmm. I actually I actually have some thoughts about how that could have been done better. Mm -hmm. um, but those, those, that was bit my agenda, mm -hmm. and it's not been necessarily others. But, uh, and the second thing is I worry that surgical training isn't what it should be mm -hmm. and is not what it once was, certainly not what it once was. Now, times are different, and, and we don't need people working 100-hour weeks. I mean, I got that. But there are some issues with training now and with the accreditation of training that, to me, are problematic. And so I've been incredibly hyperbolic uh, to the point of being bombastic and bullying uh, with, uh, with the ACGME. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't regret that at all. I don't apologize for it. Uh, I think I think we need to, I think surgical training needs to be better and uh, I think the college needs to push that as much as they can even to the point of I personally was trying to lead a charge to at least give the perception that the college might actually take over or try to retake surgical training again which we gave up in the 50s mm -hmm. uh, you know in terms of the accreditation of training if I'd had a couple more years of, of, of it, I'd have made a lot more <laughs> impact because I'd have, <laughs> I'd have raised more hell on that, as, frankly. As chair of regents? Mm -hmm. or, okay. Yeah. yeah. What, or something, you know, you need a, sometimes you need a platform. Now, I'm still working on that fairly actively. Very. Mm -hmm. Well, because I know that in your presidential address, you had mentioned uh, changing the, the paradigm of mm -hmm. surgical education. Yeah. Uh, what kinds of changes did you do you think need to be made or... I've been a, I was program director for years, mm -hmm. many, many years. I've been involved in virtually every site visit mm -hmm. to accredit our program. I never once had anybody from this organization ask me if we could train a resident operator. Mm. Never one time. That seems rather silly to me, mm -hmm. since that's supposed to be what we're, right, but that's what the public expects. Mm -hmm. Instead, you get asked things about goals and objectives and and lesson plans, and I mean, I'm not lesson plans. I'm now, I'm now being sarcastic, but, <laughs> but you know, things that really are not fundamental to what your job is, because all all programs and all accreditation programs are virtually the same. So, so pediatric oncology, child psychiatry, cardiac surgery, three totally different things, and the notion that you can have a person do a site visit from one to the other, which is what's done, mm -hmm. and that they can come away with some knowledge base that's gonna give your residency review committee information that they need to know mm -hmm. is foolish, mm -hmm. it's foolhardy. And so, to me, you, we ought to say that. We ought to say that as a college. Mm -hmm. We heard a report at the Regents meeting on Saturday that the number one clinical problem now 
that is represented in, in the survey of the, of the, uh, of the governors by, by Dr. Turner of Member Services was uh, how I find a new competent partner. Wow. And all. So that's the number one clinical problem that's identified in the country today. Uh, and that's a huge thing uh, to me. And it speaks to the fact that we're not doing this correctly. Mm -hmm. And so when things aren't being done correctly, people get hurt. This isn't, this isn't baking class we're teaching. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're literally putting people's lives in our hands. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, there, there are technical aspects that need to be mastered that we in no way now are assessing at an accreditation level. Individual programs are supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. But there are a variety of things, including a lot of legal issues sometimes that impede the way you do that. Mm -hmm. um, is the sorry. accreditation at the state level? No, the it's, it's, the, not, it's the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education. Mm, it's called okay. ACGME. Okay. Run oh, out of, oh, okay, run out okay. of Chicago. Okay. So that's been, I've challenged them very, very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. um, just to get them to look at things, I mean, to me, you have to look at things in a different light. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't, one of the things that worries me about our society now is that we seem to have two ways of dealing with things. Now I'm really getting off track, and I apologize <laughs> for it, but, but if you think about it, we either have silliness, you know, we have, we have Trumpian kinds of responses mm -hmm. where we just shout people down, or we have the other, where we have people coming and beating up people on both sides of the political spectrum because they don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. Or we're so nice and so polite that nothing ever gets done. Mm -hmm. we collegiality, oh, we've got to be collegial. I hear that, well, we've got to be. These are our colleagues. Even if they're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. well, there, I, uh, I know you, you know, whatever. And so, so to me, you, you, you have to have a reason. You don't yell or be personal, mm -hmm. but you, you do have to be logical. And sometimes those things are, are, are require a degree of impetuosity, contrariness, pick a word, <laughs> bluntness. Yeah. In terms of the collegiality, I am thinking about sort of a, an era in medicine when it's very uh, hierarchical and top down. Do, do you think the collegiality is, I don't know, an overcompensation for trying to turn that on its head to be less? I think, um, to, oh, sure, to some degree, yeah, yeah. surely. Okay. And a lot, I mean, there are some, while I don't want to believe in generational things, and certainly, you know, I'm, I'm a, I was born in 45, so I'm a, quote, pre-boomer, <laughs> I think is the phrase, I, whatever the hell that means, but, but, you know, so when people start talking about boomers and all, you know, mm -hmm. and I get, you know, I just sort of, <laughs> whatever. I'm not sure you can characterize entire generations based on anything. Okay. I'll delete that question. But, <laughs> but having said that, uh, there are certain generational characteristics mm -hmm. that don't necessarily hit everybody, but they do cut across a pretty wide swath. And clearly, things are very different now mm -hmm. than they were. And and you know, now I've never believed in in. To me, strongly hierarchical things never really worked very well. I, mm -hmm. I just, it's just, I, th I think you would find, if you, if you went to Kentucky and interviewed the, the people that work with me there, I think you'd find that they would all view me as the most down to earth, informal, easy to get along with person. Well, I really am. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so on the other hand, I tend to challenge authority a lot. Mm -hmm. If I think, I mean, to me, you don't you don't pick on little people. If you want to, you want to pick on people. Go after the people making policy. Mm -hmm. So, I had some problems with quality in my hospital when I was president of college. Mm. I thought the quality of our hospital was really was bad. Mm -hmm. This is frankly bad, and um, that occurred because of some decisions that was made at a university level to allow our hospital to be acquired functionally by a, a system mm. uh, that even though it was allegedly not for profit was certainly money was its motive and mm -hmm. and, and, and our care became very, very bad. Mm -hmm. So 
I wrote a letter to the editor of our paper. Well, I wrote a letter which got to our newspaper. So president of American College of Surgeons called University Hospital unsafe. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, so they said, did you really say that? I said, yeah, I said, did. You believe that? Oh, sure, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. you know, could I print that if you want to? And so here it is with my, uh, on the front page of the newspaper with my picture. I don't know where they got my picture, but they got my picture as a college president. Oh, this is really great. But the end result was that we got out of that system. Our hospital's doing great again. It was a good hospital. For, mm -hmm. we, it's a, it was a mission-based hospital frankly, where our mission was taken away. Mm -hmm. And we've now restored that. And I'm proud of, the, I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. you know? Did I make some people mad? Boy, you bet I did. Mm -hmm. Did people threaten me? Ooh, do your best. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did it scare me? Not the least bit. I didn't, now part of that is because I was old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot they could do to me. <laughs> didn't have a gun or anything, so, well, you know, I figured I'd be all right. This isn't the interview you were expecting, I know. But. <laughs> I, I, you know, I never know what to expect. <laughs> Um, this is kind of going back in time a little bit, because um, I know you served... We probably should do that. Yeah. <laughs> As a historical interview, yes. is that important? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, I know that you served as president of the Kentucky chapter, and you had, you've talked about doing a lot of work to build up um, relationships among uh, practitioners and academics. Mm -hmm. um, as president of the chapter, is there anything that stands out to you about your time in that, that role or um, specific issues that arose? No, right, no I mean, okay. I think... I think As a general. I, I, think, I think it was a good time. People tend to be a little more joiners than anyway. I do, I do think that's a cultural thing where people don't tend to join organizations as much today, mm. I think. Uh, or at least the focus is often much more narrow. Um, but I, the, the thing that struck me is what you can do when you, when you build a bridge and, 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 and be inclusive in terms of, of, of encouraging people by, by doing things that, that, that show them that they have value to your organization. Mm -hmm. When you when you talk about people being join, joiners and the the narrow focus, or people having more of a narrow focus now, is that in connection to increased spe specialization? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Breast surgery meetings huge. Mm -hmm. um, the biliary, you know, trauma. Uh, uh, to me, I I, I I find it rather silly, but, mm -hmm. but again, I I just think about things in a different way. I like to go learn stuff that I don't know as opposed to have things that I think I already know reinforced. Mm. I, I, I don't understand that. I'll, I'll go, if you go to a trauma meeting, you'll see the same people at every meeting. And, and there's nothing that's new ever learned. I mean, well, I don't say ever, but, mm -hmm. you know, so to me, I'd, I'd way rather go to a, to a more general meeting where I'm going to hear about cancer, what's new in cancer, what's new in other mm -hmm. things that, where I actually learn some things and stay broad-based. Not necessarily that I'm going to practice that, but at least have a knowledge base about it. Do you think it has something to do with certain requirements on surgeons no. now, or it's just cultural or I think it's a cultural thing, yeah. Okay. okay. And I, um, I was interested in your comment earlier about um, asking that um, person in the meeting to sit down because they were talking too much about how great their committee mm -hmm. was rather than what needs to be fixed. That also seems like a cultural um, point within maybe medicine and science more broadly, not highlighting failures. And I, I didn't know if you had any further comment on that or if I'm mischaracterizing that. I think, I think any organization has to be very, very careful in terms of, 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 of how the, of, of, of internally, if you've got a big organization, I mean, what gets rewarded? Mm -hmm. Is it, it's easy to create sometimes a perception of value uh, by creating metrics that, you know, that, that you design um, and also um, so you can create new programs. Do, are they needed? Are they really successful? How do you really know that? Um, and whatnot. So my point was 
that the way you move an organization forward is you look at, at unmet needs mm -hmm. uh, or challenges. My, my theme was challenges of the second century. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we need to do better? Mm -hmm. so, so if you, I didn't, I didn't I was trying to die during my presidential address. I was very sick. It was it actually was in the ICU, oh, wow. so I didn't get to give my presidential address. But so Hoyt read it, David, Dr. Hoyt, uh -huh. David Hoyt, and um, uh, which is one of the great disappointments of my life. Not that David Hoyt gave it, but he yeah. did a good job. But that that I didn't get to. Uh -huh. But um, I. I've talked about stuff that if you really read between the lines or just read it, mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk about challenging traditional institutions on that are doing accreditation and, and, and involved in training and suggest that the college perhaps need to be more involved and maybe even take that over, that's fairly radical. Mm -hmm. I've tried to say it in a diplomatic way. I think I did. Mm -hmm. But anybody that knows me knew what I was talking about. When you talk about representation, uh, I said I think the day will come when we're going to need an organization to represent physicians and well surgeons in probably a different way when everybody becomes employed mm -hmm. and and whatnot. Uh, so one of the quality things that Dr. Hoyt, and Dr. Coe uh, have working on, and I've been involved with, and you know, even as I'm phasing out in a formal relationship in terms of an officership, mm -hmm. is working on the quality things that might actually sort of empower surgeons again to, to take a little more control of the quality within their own institution. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I, when I, then that article came out in the newspaper that I referred to earlier, mm -hmm. I got a number of phone calls around the country. The tenor was, oh, how did you do this? Why did you do this? Mm -hmm. Well, were you crazy? You know, <laughs> once we got past those kinds of questions, then it was, how can I become more? You know, mm. because qu the quality stuff now is so often top down. You know, but people don't really under often don't really understand quite what it is that they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. It's just quality. Mm -hmm. And so, what what we're now trying to become involved with is a way to see if if we can get surgeons much more engaged again, or at least some cadre within within our hospitals and, and our healthcare organizations involved in, in, in ownership of quality again. And mm -hmm. I, I made that point and again the presidential address. You you either own the quality or it's going to own you eventually because mm -hmm. that's those kind of metrics are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. They just need to be the proper metrics. And now so often the way that we're measured is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. Well and it, it strikes me that quality was so critical to the organization's founding and history Correct. that it's it's interesting to hear that coming reemerging as an issue that the organization needs to address. Has to. Yeah. I mean, and, and part of it's about cost, uh, but part of it's also fairness. If you look at a map of the areas of of let's say you take mortality uh, by county, and there there those demographics are available. They're available for every county in America. And you look at the area where I grew up in eastern Kentucky, mm -hmm. poor, rural, um, highest instance of lung cancer in the country, mm -hmm. one of the highest instances of diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, advanced stage diseases, and all. And you, and you plot those out on color maps with dark colors being bad. All of eastern Kentucky is dark. Yeah. And so you have to, those are kinds of things that you can't, you can't just judge a hospital or a surgeon on just crude mortality, for example, from some things. Uh, and that's why things like Nisquip and, our, and, and some of the other products that the college has developed for, for quality measurements are so essential because of, of the risk adjustment factor which we have to use. But those things are expensive, they're cumbersome, they're harder to use. And so part of the mission of the college has been to engage, you know, the, the CMS, the funding arm for Medicare, mm -hmm. and private insurers and, and payers that, you know, 
the, this is complicated. You, you've got to have a little more sophisticated metrics. Mm -hmm. And we, we have those metrics and are going to help you develop those things. Mm -hmm. But just looking at crude, who lived, who died, isn't a way to do it. Right. Right. If you look at, for example, at some of the quality things, uh, operative mortality is incredibly important. If you have a patient die on the operating table, we have patients die at University Hospital on the operating table all the time. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Are they elective cases? Almost never. Almost never happens. Gunshot wound to the abdomen, 18-year-old kid, drive-by shooting, mm -hmm. major vessel injury. You're going to do everything you can to save that kid, even though you know going in that in all likelihood you may fail. But mm -hmm. you're going to because he's 18 years old, and you know, you're going to try to do that. If he dies on the operating table, and, and that's on you, I mean, what kind of a fairness system is that? Mm -hmm. But that's the way so many of our systems now are, are gauged, frankly, because they just look at crude, easy to measure stuff. It's easy to measure living and dead, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean anything if you don't have more sophisticated metrics. Right. And it's very crucial that the college do that on behalf of surgeons and more importantly, on behalf of their patients. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned the the council or committee on trauma earlier. Is that something that you've also been working on with that committee, or is that your experience on that committee? Did, okay. years ago. Okay. Well, I was very active years ago. Okay. But, I mean, I have no, I have no, you know, particular involvement now other mm -hmm. than having tried to occasionally influence policy and about different <laughs> things. Well, um, when you were on that committee, uh, did you, do you remember what issues you were discussing at the time, or any? I was, <laughs> <laughs> We're going too far back. We no, <laughs> no. I, I, I sometimes want to swim upstream, uh -huh. even though I'm a bit of a windmill tilter, even though I know I'm <laughs> going to lose. It's just my nature. I can't help it. <laughs> so the thing that worried me at the time was that some of our accreditation mm -hmm. was to, was to our, the job of accreditation is trying to help hospitals be better, not to, not to be a, you know, a gotcha. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And sometimes, I think, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that, you know, that we're not a regulator. That's not our job. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we have no authority to regulate anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, our job's really to make, make things better. And so I had some issues with sometimes that we, we just lost sight of that, you know, occasionally uh, that I would worry about. And we had to be very careful and cognizant of the fact that you know, we, 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 we have the power of, 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 of that, that is given to us by, by others. We don't, you know, except with a few states that designate the college to do things. But, but by and large, it's, you know, it's the consent of the governed, if you will, you know. You have had a number of leadership positions, but one that uh, stood out to me was that you were the founding president of the Kentucky Vascular Surgical mm -hmm. Society. I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the origins of that or anything? No, I did, we just, it was just a group of people. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's going now. Okay. But I started, I was doing a fair bit of vascular surgery and, and all, and that's how I was listed as a vascular regent, even though I did broad-based surgery. I didn't, I never considered myself a vascular surgeon. I did a lot of vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. And all that became a fairly, <laughs> I, I almost didn't get elected a regent because I was nominated as a vascular regent. Mm. And so there were a few people who objected to calling me vascular because I was not, quote, pure vascular. <laughs> I didn't know what pure vascular meant, but I <laughs> sort of did. But, well, I didn't know what it meant, but I thought it was rather petty. I did get elected, but it was, I, I wrote a book chapter on mentoring, actually, <laughs> recently, and I, I, it, was, it was the most embarrassed I've ever been about anything in my life. That, that moment? Or, yeah. Or, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Because a couple of people who, including people who were allegedly my friends, got up and said, well, he really shouldn't be elected a regent because he's not a, quote, pure vascular surgeon. Wow. Which was never a criteria for anything, frankly. But, I mean, and, and I think that's a thing about the college I do worry about is we have, a, as our regents now, we have a lot of, quote, specialty regents. And, uh -huh. and to me, we, we, that's an important distinction as to have. But sometimes we have to think about the greater good, which is, what some might refer to as the house of surgery, or, or really what's what's good for all all patients, really. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't, I guess I didn't realize they were uh, specialty regents, because mm -hmm. I thought they came from... Um, Virtually every yeah. specialty has a regent. Okay, okay. Um, so, in... I guess in terms of coming from, um, as governor of uh, the Kentucky chapter, and then, um, and like trying to negotiate between um, the the chapter and then the national um, level of the organization, did you face any particular challenges in that intersection that we haven't discussed? I think the yet? hardest thing is communication. Right. In <sighs> this is another. Uh, this is for archival purposes, I presume, so mm -hmm. that hundreds of years from now, you know, they can think of that. What in the world is that old man talking about? Um, I find it fascinating that we've got all these things to communicate about, but but nobody knows what the heck we're doing. Mm. Uh, we have Twitter now. We've got Instagrams. We've mm -hmm. got Facebook. We've mm -hmm. got all this stuff, and then people will say. Well, when is the college going to do something about this? And then it turns out that something that we're very actively involved on, and that information is disseminated almost mm -hmm. daily or monthly. Mm -hmm. And so you still got, you still got to open stuff. You got to read. You got to mm -hmm. you know you're and and so I think communication between chapters, between fellows and in leadership is the hardest thing mm -hmm. perhaps the college has to try to do. It's very difficult. People are their interests are different. They're mm -hmm. you know people are time time constrained. It's 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 very difficult to do. It's not in the college tries. Believe me, um, we have a whole sections that you know we we all there's social media. We have all kinds of stuff, but you you've got to want to be communicated with. That's the other, mm -hmm. other part. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it strikes me that you're saying this, uh, being that you were governor, uh, 1989 to 1995. Because when I think about Inundation. I very much think about, uh, I guess, the last ten years and the growth of social media and mm -hmm. more and more technology, technological communication. Um, and so, this was already an issue that has just. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think our communication with fellows is any better now than it was in the eighties and nineties. Okay. And things change at all. Is it something to do with engagement, or how do you? I don't know. Oh, you know. people are just busy. They just, you know, mm -hmm. you just people got lives to lead. I mean, you know, it's, mm -hmm. stuff becomes important to them, and it's important to them. You know, and some people live and breathe it, and 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 some don't. But that's to me, that's that's it's like spreading those seeds. I mean, you know, some take it, some don't. Mm -hmm. Some people are engaged, and many aren't. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, I think communication's always been difficult, and and I don't, I don't. I mean, I think social media perhaps has helped in some ways, and, and mm -hmm. maybe it'll be, maybe that'll be more uh, more important as ever people adopt, plat but then the platforms are going to change, mm -hmm. and, you know, today's Twitter is tomorrow something different, and, and who knows. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting when people start, whatever replaces Google to try to figure out what Twitter was 20 years <laughs> from now. Uh, in, so in terms of <laughs> rural surgical care, <laughs> I'm just switching gears a little bit, um, what strikes me as the two important elements for that are training in general surgery and also um, prompting physicians to go to these rural areas. Because I, I know that, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the year, uh, but there was a Health Manpower Act, I think, in maybe 71 that was trying to meet needs for growing needs for physicians mm -hmm. um, and the big issue that kind of emerged out of that was that the the phys physicians were being trained in large universities often in mm -hmm. cities and then staying in the cities mm -hmm. and so I didn't know if you had any comments on what efforts are necessary or what efforts you have taken in your different leadership roles to try to uh, increase access to surgical care in rural areas. I have lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't, none of them are gained as much traction as I would like. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the college needs to be much more politically engaged, as I said, in, in, um, in uh, trying to push access to rural health care. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just rural, I mean, it could be underserved. Uh, uh, there, uh, the, the 
we have a general surgical shortage that's at a crisis level now, right. and and whatnot, and so that and that's not hyperbolic to say that. I mean, I, I think that's uh, absolutely true, and so we, in my view, and this again is a very contrarian view, mm -hmm. I think, uh, we're training people in the wrong places. Uh, we're training people in university hospitals that all have high, highly technically oriented service lines, transplant, or, and, and people aren't going to do transplant out in practice. I mean, it's, it's nuts. I mean, I mean, the average general surgery resident a few, few years ago was spending four months on a transplant service, and they're never going to take care of a transplant patient in their life unless they're one of the one in a thousand that, that goes into transplantation. Mm -hmm. So, and then they can't find a job today, at least, because there are no jobs in transplant service. So we have a model that is not meeting the country's needs for training, mm -hmm. we, for, for producing the, the kinds of surgeons that we need. I believe when I was on the residency review committee, and I pushed really hard uh, when I was in a leadership position on that committee as a part of the ACGME, mm -hmm. to increase the number of surgical residencies and residents, and we got that accomplished. Mm. It was my belief, I think falsely, uh, dumb, you know, I believed <laughs> that market forces might then, you know, if you just trained enough people, some of them would go. Mm -hmm. it turns out all we're doing is just training more people to go into fellowships mm -hmm. that aren't needed. America right now doesn't need another surgical oncologist. We couldn't, and boy, this will piss off the uh, surgical oncologist, but I say it, and I, I don't say anything behind people's back that don't say it in their face. I mean, it's just not my nature. Mm -hmm. So. We're not training what the country needs, but we're not addressing that in any meaningful kind of way. And for the college, if you think about it, it's a very, very difficult because one problem with a big umbrella organization is that everybody sleeps under that tent or you want them to. Mm. And most of those, frankly, are academic types, <laughs> you know, like, like me. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm an academic kind of guy. Mm -hmm. It's just because of my nature and because of what I did in practice, I just have a different view of what, what the, the country's needs are. Mm -hmm. Because I actually look around and go visit places and, and I hear, I know what the needs are. Mm -hmm. Needs are for general surgery, primarily. And interesting, the country, country, I mean, that's what most people, if you talk to people, that's what the needs are, but that's not what we're producing. And it's America, and it's freedom of choice, and follow your dreams, and all that stuff. The problem is that young men and, and women don't really, they're not, if you don't, it's, it's hard to produce a general surgeon if you've never seen one. Mm -hmm. And most people in academic surgeons anymore, in surgery anymore, approach, have never seen a general surgeon, mm -hmm. unless you sit in a private environment someplace. Because most universities don't have such a thing. Mm -hmm. And the more elite you are in this country, the less likely you are to have general surgery as a part of even your, even your vocabulary. It's frowned upon, and that that needs to change. And it only will change when people break some eggs, mm -hmm. rock the boat, make the omelet, make the omelet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I'm glad somebody else did that. I did <laughs> but I ramble, so. That's why. Um, well, because in in terms of. Uh, Oh, um, so, because when talking about the crisis and how it's not hyperbolic, uh, I know that I had read a bit about uh, George Sheldon, who had been president um, before, uh, gosh, I can't remember yeah, how many years now. Yeah, yeah but he, um, he had been writing about this upcoming crisis. And, mm. and so it's, it strikes me how long that we're talking about the crisis. No, the no, crisis and so, so I did, did a fair bit of work with with Dr. Sheldon mm -hmm. at the Sheps that Sheps Center in in, in North Carolina, mm -hmm. which does a lot of a variety of of particular health demographics and position distribution and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So so um, uh, one of the phrases that that George and, and that group used was what what are called surgical deserts, mm -hmm. where you just have vast areas of, of the country with very little coverage. And so people think about this differently. I hear, well, we'll, we'll just regionalize care, and that's fine. But 
most of the people who say that are in big academic centers, and what they really want is they really want what they want. They want paying patients that fit their model of things. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in taking care of people with appendicitis who have Medicaid, frankly. Mm -hmm. you don't, I've never seen anybody who has a, medi uh, a Medicaid appendicitis service line. I ain't seen that yet. Mm -hmm. so, so we need care closer to home, um, and we need quality care. Now, I'm not saying that every little city in Kentucky has 120 counties, for Pete's mm -hmm. sake. So not every county in Kentucky needs a hospital. But, but, but when academics talk about regionalization, what they tend to talk about is send me your patients, especially the ones I want. Mm -hmm. And so, so when, when the regionalization I would talk about is, is really more, more spoken wheel kind of things with, you know, there's some things that need to be done in big high. If you're gonna do a, a, a pancreatic resection or esophageal resection, those need to be done in, in centers. Uh, when you, you know, you, you should be able to get your hernia fixed without having to go 80 miles one way. Or if you've got a 10-year-old child who has abdominal pain and you might have appendicitis, to me it's criminal to put them in a, a cab or a car or something and have them drive 100 miles to be told maybe they do, maybe they don't, be sent back home uh, or get a CAT scan because you don't have a surgeon who will come and see them and so you're going to radiate a child needlessly because they don't have a good surgical evaluation where someone can just lay their hand on mm -hmm. and through a skilled clinician probably can tell we have appendicitis or not, if that's likely or not. Mm -hmm. and, and we've lost, we've lost much of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I think we, I believe that, that those of us involved in training, and, and I've, been, I've been chairman of the American Board of Surgery, I mean, vice chair of the residence review committee. I was on both those for seven years, mm -hmm. and I've been an academic. So, so, I mean, I'm one of the guilty, if you want to look at it that way. I think we've done a terrible job of producing what the country needs, and I hope that when people look at this, if anybody ever bothers to look at it, <laughs> some years from now, that that maybe that will have changed. But but it will only change by people who. Who, who really, it will not change, this will not be an evolutionary change. In mm -hmm. my opinion. This will recur only because of some revolutionary thing that people decide, and, and particularly what I've been trying to get some rural people to do is to rise up, you know, call your representative. Well, hell no, mm -hmm. we won't go. We're not taking this anymore. Mm -hmm. We want care closer to home. I don't want to have to drive to Louisville to get, to get my appendix done or my hernia fixed. Mm -hmm. And the average age of our general surgeon in the country, you know, is up in the 50s. Uh, that's an impending problem, I think. Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned uh, the role of the president being um, honorific. Is honorific. The word I used. Honorific mm -hmm. is the word you used. Uh, and I had seen in a, another presidential address by uh, Dr. Eastman call it uh, being an ambassador of sorts. So. Do you, do you you would agree with the assessment of I think that's I think that's pretty true okay um, did you so in, in the role of president did you also have um, a lot of connections uh, or maybe even on the regents in terms of like of the international nature of the yeah I did very little I was I had some significant health issues. And I did a knee replacement, which went great. God bless my orthopedic surgeon. Um, I had bone on bone knee and oh. had a knee replacement. Oh. I'd had a lot of spine trouble and I had some titanium rods in my back and I was still working and getting along managing that. And while doing the physical therapy and some stretching and squatting and stuff, I managed to wreck my back. Ended up in the hospital, got in back operation, got infection, bled, clotted a bunch of stuff off. Wow. Um, had a lot of problems in the hospital, three months, and I missed a good bit of, so I, I missed my, my inauguration. Uh -huh. Which I really, it was, it, was, it was the biggest disappointment I've ever had in my life from a professional standpoint because I was really looking, I was looking forward to giving my own presidential address because mm -hmm. I do have my own style as you may have. <laughs> may, have really? noted, may have noted, <laughs> and so, and so, so I was going to let it all hang out. I was just going to go mm -hmm. for it, and so, 
Um, I have a bit of that Southern Baptist preacher in me, but at any <laughs> rate, so, um, and I also missed my dinner. I had, um, it was in Chicago, and I'd auditioned an African American choir oh, wow. uh, to sing at the uh, at the dinner, uh -huh. and so <laughs> when I talked to the, the gentleman that we that I I'd picked out, listened to a bunch of tapes, and I thought I like this one better. Uh -huh. So I talked to this guy on the phone, and and I said, "What well, you have to do my old Kentucky home to finish it?" He said, "I don't know that we don't do that." I said, "Geez, I'm sorry to take your time." And, <laughs> He said, what do you mean? I said, you mean we're done? I said, yeah, I'll find somebody that does. He said, I've never heard of that. I said, well, you can YouTube it. So, so he calls me back 10 or 15 minutes. He said, that's a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. So they ended up, I've, I will admit, I've not been able to watch any part of, of the thing yet. I, I just, it's it, I just, because I was literally in the intensive care unit when, yeah. this was, when this was going on. I had 29 operations from June until Christmas to the year wow. I was president. So I didn't do much international travel. Uh -huh. um, to me, we I will say and I, that I think our president's never doing too much international travel. I believe that. It's now become a contest to see how many you can do. Mm. So these are my friends, and I love them, but I think they. I think you need to focus. We are the American College of Surgeons. Mm -hmm. I said that a lot and make people mad when I say it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be international in scope. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But but we've got to be careful that the tail doesn't wag the dog mm -hmm. in uh, in that sense. And and, uh, and we have a lot of problems in America that we haven't faced, figured out yet. So I, I marvel when all our young people, we, 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 we congratulate them on how they want to go to sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. And I ask them, would you go to Whitesburg, Kentucky? They said, what? I said, well, it's a poor mining town in eastern Kentucky. Would you go there? Would you be willing to go spend a month or so doing a local town? Well, of course not. I mean, mm -hmm. why would I do that? Mm -hmm. That doesn't go well at cocktail parties, and you don't pat yourself on the back to go to places like Whitesburg, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So to me, until we've solved some of those problems, I don't know that we're going to fix Africa. I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, so we all, can we try and can we be helpful? Sure, mm -hmm. God bless us. But, but we've got tons of problems with delivery in America that we haven't addressed yet. And, and I guess I get frustrated when we spend, we've, for example, spent two days at one of our regents meetings talking about international engagement, and we've never ever talked in, the, in my 12 years of been involved with the regents about how we, how we could do anything in a concentrated way other than my one session uh -huh. about what we might do for rural, for rural care. Never once. So that offends me, frankly. Uh -huh. And I've said that to people, and, and that's why I say if I'd had a couple more years, we'd have had that dialogue, but I only had one year. So. Uh -huh. Do you think it's uh, sort of a blindness to American exceptionalism, or is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's sort of not fashionable now. Okay. Because what strikes me as potentially really useful and engaging about the international connections is thinking about different problems in access. Because I'm, I mean, I imagine that there are plenty of rural areas. I mean, in Europe or other in Africa. I mean, Australia. access is an issue all over. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so I, I was thinking about what kinds of uh, exchanges of ideas could occur at that level, um, but I don't know if that's happening necessarily. Well, it's, uh, to some degree, I guess it is, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I'm I do realize now. What a troglodyte this makes me look like, you know, that I'm, I'm old-fashioned, anti-progress, you know, all the bad stuff you'd want to say about old white men. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, I, 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 it's not that I'm blind to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, but, but I do marvel at how, at how we rush to, to fix things in other places where we often don't understand the culture, mm -hmm. the, the politics, do we don't even ask if they want to be fixed or how how can we get, we just sort mm -hmm. of do it mm -hmm. in this kind of almost missionary kind of zeal that we have and and which is which is wonderful in in many ways but and i understand we've got a lot of regulatory issues that prevent a lot of that same kind of thing in this country i mean i, I got that but for example i was very interested in in why couldn't we have a national surgical health service mm -hmm. Why couldn't we push for that? Would that work having a clue? And so the National Health Service now, you can be an internist, OB-GYN, or a dentist. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing, and you two years, you know, and you repay stuff. 
Well, two years, you can wait out two years. I've never been in jail, but you could probably <laughs> wait that out. And they used to say time only matters if you're in jail, but at any rate, uh, so, but if you, if you gave debt forgiveness for a year of medical school, as well as what, what your salary was gonna be, and you embedded somebody in a community that's really rural, I mean, whatever, define it however you want to define it, mm -hmm. then some of, those, some of those seeds might actually plant. You might figure, you know, this is, this is not all bad. Traffic's not bad. Hunting and fishing. I, live, I grew up in a beautiful part of the country. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if you like mountains and, you know, and I mean, they're not deep mountains, but wooded areas, great lakes, great hunting, fishing. Schools are not bad. Public schools are actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Got a state university there. You know, it's, it's local hillbilly culture, but it's it's what <laughs> it is. And so, so some of that, you know, you might actually grow. But but when I say politically, those are to me kinds of things that we could work on. And and you and you begin to work your rural constituents, or your rural representatives, to say, you know, why don't we do something about this? Mm -hmm. And why don't we? Why don't we try to fix this? Because mm -hmm. market forces don't seem to be working. Appealing demands better nature sure doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> and so sometimes I think these are going to require different kinds of solutions. Maybe GME funding needs to change mm. to, to reward those who are actually producing general surgeons out of a general surgery residency yeah. as opposed to 10 plastic surgeons every yeah. two or three years. Well, and I guess the other thing I was thinking about was patient advocacy, but you don't have a, an association of people with appendicitis <laughs> who are going to be demanding new, another and general you, surgeon. And, and what you really have, though, are a lot of poor people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who don't have access to, to, to or don't know how to do anything. Mm -hmm. They're underrepresented. Mm -hmm. and, they, yeah. and they, you know, so who speaks for them? Yeah. And I... In talking about the potential for the international exchange of ideas, I didn't mean it as a critique. No, 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 no. Um, but I, I guess I was thinking more of the what you had been saying about going to Africa in this mission, with this missionary zeal, and not recognize and not seeing that there are problems elsewhere, there, but there are also problems here, and that is something. That yeah, I and and about. and so so using, <clears throat> I think I think a. A strategy that is now being developed by Operation Giving Back, which is a wonderful thing the college mm -hmm. has, mm -hmm. is to actually see if how we can improve training. You know, the, the teach a man to fish mm -hmm. analogy. You know, as opposed to you know give him a fish kind of deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think I think the college is now beginning to be engaged more in that, and I think that's a much much more useful much more useful strategy, frankly, in the long term. So this is a, a bit of a big question. I'll try to shorten my <laughs> and <answer. I'll laughs> Well, I don't know if it's uh, too We're going on too long. She keeps looking at her clock back there, so I know <laughs> I'm talking to her. Um, well, so in joining the college in 1980, and then now it's 2017, I didn't know if you had any, uh, I don't know, significant reflection on major changes you've seen or specific uh, ideas that you have seen come into fruition really nicely or anything you wanted to comment on in that time? If you look at, <clears throat> I was involved in the early development of trauma centers and trauma systems. Mm -hmm. The first books on those, the first sort of guidelines, books of standards and, and the optimal resource of trauma care were written in Louisville and I was a scribe. Mm -hmm. So it's fascinating to me to see how that level one trauma center is now a part of almost everyone's lexicon. I mean, it's amazing mm -hmm. how that, that's come into common use. I mean, people wouldn't have a clue what a level one trauma center is. You know, they know about it from television and from, mm -hmm. you know, from ER and Chicago Med and all those things. Or you can go look these up in the future too. <laughs> uh, you know, so they, you know, whatever. So, so. And, and that's an amazing transformation that's happened within my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And the college was responsible for that. I mean, it was. In, in that trauma model of using, of developing standards, you know, setting out 
some guidelines and, and then some standards based on those, which would hopefully be best practices or, or, or whatnot. And then doing surveys and critiques, evaluations, and, and generally not accrediting because that, that signifies a more legal term, but verifying that at least those things are in place. Mm -hmm. And then looking back and seeing, well, that, that, that loop closure permit. Well, how has this worked? What have you done? Have we really And there's huge amount of data from all over the, 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 this country, and in fact, now all over the world, that having developed trauma systems really work. And that, the trauma, then in bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery has now become, you know, um, for morbidly obese, has now become an incredibly safe surgery mm -hmm. and operation. Um, and a lot of that was because of the college's influence in that in that certifying or ver verifying those those centers. Mm -hmm. So lots of good things that that we've done uh, along that concept that have been just remarkable if you think about it mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of of how the college's influenced care in, in in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. And in terms of changes over time as well, you had mentioned, I believe, in a presidential address that there was a lot of rigidity within the Board of Regents for several decades, and you maybe you suggested that, <laughs> there, that, that, that that had changed or was changing, oh, and yeah. I was just wondering if you had any more commentary oh, no, it, on that. It, the, I was with one of the groups that went in to present some trauma things. I've been laws in me. We were just, wow. <laughs> we were beat upon with sticks, figuratively. Mm -hmm. and, and and it took quite a while. It was it was it was all old white men. I mean mm -hmm. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm very that's why I've used that old white man thing two or three <laughs> times today because that's what. I'm, and the college is very different now. I mean it's different. It's mm -hmm. it's it's there's the the represent the resident associate society, the RAS, mm -hmm. the YFA, the Young Fellows uh, Group. And, and people really listen. I mean, they honestly do. And they take those things to heart. And, and there are changes that are made based on that. Uh, the, the, the group's obviously much more diverse in terms of color, in terms mm -hmm. of, of gender, mm -hmm. uh, incredibly so. And, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I think that's a, a thing, again, the college, I mean, it's any, it's, I mean, that's, that's been a, not a unique trend for the American College of Surgeons, but mm -hmm. it's, one well, I think the college should certainly be proud of. Mm -hmm. in, this is a question in terms of what kind of advice you might give to medical students who want to specialize in surgery, um, or if you have any specific advice for residents in you know, surgery. Well, I, uh, Barbara Bass was present last night, so I think her theme, if I got it right, her title was was the was the joy of, of surgery, mm -hmm. and to me, I viewed it. Now I, I grew up in a in a a fairly religious background, and the notion of calling was a was a thing that that was important in in my belief system. You mm -hmm. know that you were. I don't mean that you clouds opened up and somebody <laughs> said be a surgeon, <laughs> but that you were you were perhaps led to things that. That uh, you know, and so to me, I really wanted to help people. I mean, I really did, and I think I've done a heck of a lot of that in my life. In fact, mm -hmm. I know I have, in a variety of ways, not just in. I mean, I listen to people. I try to be kind to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I love my patients. I, I. I mean, I feel this personal kind of connection when I see people sick, and especially with some of the things that 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 awful things that happen to people it's mm -hmm. just awful and and so you want to do what you can to 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 make that better and I think for for I guess for young people today I to me you embrace the calling aspect of it and and it's I have a daughter who's a who does OB-GYN mm. and she's an amazing person mm -hmm. Her only bad fault is she's very much like me in, in, in some of the ways she, but she's wonderful with patients. She's so good. She works, just works incredibly hard. Uh, but, but, you know, when I, when I see people now, they, so now 
I'm Dr. Richardson's father is, is what I'm now driven. I, I mean, you go someplace. You know, I can't go in a Walmart when out because, you know, people go, oh, you're Dr. Richardson's father. <laughs> See, I am. Yeah. What did you do for a living? I said, oh, I'm whatever. So, so I'm totally, I've sucked into anonymity, which is okay. That's it's the way it ought to be. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing I'm so proud of is the way she embraces the profession. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an honor to, to be able to do what we do. I mean, just think about it. I mean, to, to bring new life into the world like she does, I mean, just, it's an amazing thing mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do and, and, you know, to do that as safely as possible and, and whatnot. Or, uh, I was involved in doing the first 25 liver transplants in Kentucky with, mm. with an associate. And, um, uh, you know, to see people that are, you know, about the, this color of yellow mm -hmm. and, and they're that color of green, you know, because their livers failed. And, you know, you get them out of the hospital in a week or two and, and you bump into them, you know, 10 years later as I did recently. I'm a horse race guy, so I, I was at the horse races. One of her liver transplant patients came up and she's now 20 some years out, you know, and she's still That's doing amazing. fine. That's an amazing, it's an amazing thing mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And to me, that's a gift from God. That's just that's just a blessing uh, that that we have. That uh, uh, you know, they just you don't get that in anything else that I know of. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, your your internists may save your life slowly. To say you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> giving you statins and keeping your blood pressure. <laughs> that's important. That's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my brother's a brother that does GI medicine. You know, if you've ever had bad reflux and you can fix that, that's that's good. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm proud of him. He's a great doctor, and whatnot. But you know, so those they may save your life slowly. Surgeons sometimes can save it very quickly, mm -hmm. and, and there's enormous reward in, in being able to do that. Great. Is there is there anything else you wanted to talk about today that we haven't touched on, or that you wanted to bring up? Yeah. Okay. One more thing. Okay. The balanced life. Mm -hmm. So, I wrote a, <laughs> I gave a presidential address years ago on surgery and the balanced life. Mm -hmm. Before anybody, I'd never ever heard of anybody talking about work-life balance. I'd never heard that phrase. And so, to me, I, I do believe, and again, this is, I hesitate to say it, but as you know, I probably will. Um, <laughs> I do believe work-life balance runs a risk of being a cop out if you're not careful. How so? What do you mean? I worked a lot of 100-hour weeks. Mm -hmm. 80 hours was a pretty slow week. Mm -hmm. you know? My wife passed away two years ago, but I love my wife dearly. She'd been ill for quite a while. I took care of her. I, I did everything, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the latter stages of real illness. Mm -hmm. Still worked hard, did things, you know. My children love me. I'm very, I'm pathologically close to my children. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be a day goes by harder than I don't talk to my kids. Mm -hmm. They live close. My grandchildren, I think, like me. <laughs> um, I sure adore them. Um, you know, I've had a passionate interest in horse racing. I've had an enormous totally different kind of career in that. Mm -hmm. I'm chairman of a thing called Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders of America, which would be like oh. sort of American College of Surgeons for horse owners. Yeah. I've been in a thing called the Breeders' Cup Board that, you know, and I'm a racing commissioner in Kentucky mm -hmm. uh, that regulates racing in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And so I've had this very full life outside surgery uh, that's been very rich and rewarding. And my point is, I've had a pretty successful academic career. I've had a very big practice career. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm close to my family. I call my mom and dad every day while they were alive mm -hmm. uh, for years, every day, you know. Um, so I, I, I just, nobody gets it all. I mean, this is in anything. I mean, it's not the way life is. No, mm -hmm. Nobody gets it all. But I think if you if you try and you work hard, you, you can you can still 
there's no, you know, you don't have to work 40 hours a week. You don't have to give up on your patients. You don't have to, you, you can be there for people and all. And too often it's, well, this is about my life. It's, well, what about me and my life and my enjoyment, and my golf or my this or my wife or my kids. I want to, and, and interestingly, I suspect I'm closer to my children than an awful lot of people I know that work 35, 40 hours a week mm -hmm. and have very truncated kind of schedules because it really is about your commitment to what you're trying to do. So that's a thing I do worry about a bit. Uh, and, and the other thing about being sick is uh, when I was, I had probably, I think I, about 30 doctors or maybe more, at least 30 mm -hmm. when I was sick. And you know what it is? If you have 30 doctors, you know how many doctors you have? A do what? Zero. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. Well, zero. So we talk a lot about team care. You've got to have team care. you yeah, got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But unless somebody really takes ownership of that and really is involved in it and really says, this is my patient, I'm going to be there for them, you know, I'm going to be there to give them the bad news. I'm going to hold their hand when they do that. I'll talk to you, you know, you know, I'll try to control your pain when you're dying. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll get my butt out of bed at night and come in and reoperate on you and not leave that to my partner mm -hmm. because I'm the, I'm the, I'm responsible. Mm -hmm. Do I want to do that? No, I'd rather sleep. Mm -hmm. Do I want to miss? So can I tell one story then? Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll stop on this. <laughs> well, I have a, a follow-up question for oh, that, too. Okay. So my wife died, as I say, a couple of years ago. And I think the natural question that, that sometimes you ask yourself is, you know, was I really, did I really do, was I a good husband? You know, mm -hmm. did I do, I mean, did I do, did I do this right? Mm -hmm. Uh and, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was troubled by that, obviously, because I'm, I'm a 24-7, seven, seven days a week kind of guy about mm -hmm. stuff I do. I just, that's just my nature. And I'd rather take a whipping than sit on the beach. I mean, I, I mean it's just, <laughs> just, just not me. I mean, I, and, you know, so, so I, I reflected on that and, and whatnot. So within a month after that, um, my medical assistant called and said, there's a patient named so-and-so, name it nothing to me, who insists on seeing you now. He's got some, you know, can't come in regular office hours. Mm -hmm. Could you see him in here? He's got some, he's working and he's got a day off. And I, and I said, what's the problem? And he said, well, he's got rocks in his leg. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said uh, he has rocks in his leg. And she said, I don't know. So his wife then called back, and she's all mad. And <laughs> could, well, i got to come see this. <laughs> so, so I go to the office. I recognize the kid pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Twelve years ago, he was hunting. He blazed a shotgun down as he crosses a fence, which you're never supposed to do. You're supposed to take shells out of your shotgun. Shotgun kicks back on him, mm. goes off, and blows his leg out. I had operated all day that day mm -hmm. doing, doing a, an operation called a pelvic exoneration with one of my urology colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd then done an esophagectomy that afternoon, which is both big operations. I was whipped. It's my wife's birthday. Oh, wow. <clears throat> we had a family birthday deal. Mm -hmm. And so I get a call from one of my partners, and he says, this kid has no pulses in his leg, and he has a massive soft tissue wound because uh, his popliteal artery and vein going down at the, behind the knee were blown away. Mm -hmm. And so if I take his leg off, which it looks like I'm going to have to do, um, he's going to have a high above knee amputation. He'll almost certainly never walk again, mm -hmm. uh, even with today's prosthetics. It'd be very difficult. Certainly, then it would not have been possible, frankly, to have walked. Mm -hmm. Maybe could have used crutches. Maybe I don't know, but not. And he said, "I can't fix this." Vascular people, a couple other people were out of town. 
could you come, you want, you want me to do an amputee or do you want to come take a look? Mm. So the, that's often the moment, those kinds of things are the moment that then test you. Mm -hmm. So, so do you leave your wife's birthday party, one of the big fancy party, and so I got up, I said, look, I, let me just go see. I said, probably it's nothing we can do, mm -hmm. but let me just go see. Mm -hmm. And I kissed my wife, told her I loved her, and got home at 10 o'clock the next morning. And we, we did a, a long leg bypass around this thing, took a vein from the other side, managed to get reconstructed, put some muscle over all this stuff, mm -hmm. had to fix him, you know, do some stuff some more cleanup work, mm -hmm. uh, got a lot of pellets out and the wadding and all from a shotgun, mm -hmm. got a lot of that stuff out, but he's still a lot of pellets in his leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, then eventually skin grafted his leg. So this is this kid now. Wow. And so the wife is just busting me good. <laughs> that, well, why did you leave him this way, she keeps saying. And I said, so what he had done is he had these calcifications around these pellets uh -huh. And it's a thing, heterotopic calcification or ossification, it's called. Uh -huh. And they were just spread out, and they felt like rocks. And wow. they didn't hurt him too bad. Uh -huh. he, she just didn't like it. She, you know, she'd met him five years, you know, five years before when he's, and he was walking fine. Uh -huh. He had a job. He, he was actually fine. Uh -huh. And so, and he kept trying to, and, and I remembered the circumstance of the case very well. What I'd forgotten was it was my wife's birthday. And so he finally says to his wife, he said, honey, he said, please shut up. <laughs> he said, this doctor came in and worked all night to save my leg on his wife's birthday. Mm -hmm. So I sort of thought that was God telling me that maybe, you know, some of that wasn't all bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, that's, you know, the, the rewarding part of yeah. that job. I yeah. mean, because when, you, when you're talking about the very long weeks, I was thinking about just all of the, uh, articles that have been written about physician burnout, and I'm certainly the case in surgery as well. Um, See, to me, what I find fascinating is you want to write about, you want to make people burn out, start writing about burnout. Hmm. I mean, we have, we have stress all the time, but, but let's, let's call it, so let's call it burnout. Oh, I'm burned out. Oh, geez. <laughs> Let me get some burnout therapy now. Let me get off for a month or two. It's, you want to, I mean, so now everybody believes, oh, God, this burn oh, it's terrible, burn out. <laughs> well, it seems like you you combated the burnout with your yeah. interest in horse. Yeah. And, no, uh, you know, you had get a life. I mean, you know, get a life. I mean, you know, <laughs> quit feeling sorry for yourself. Get mm -hmm. a life. You make a lot of money. You're doing good for people. Mm -hmm. You know, is it easy? Hell no, it's not easy, but nothing is. Mm -hmm. I got relatives that farm for a living. You imagine getting up every day and trying to figure out what's going to rain or not? Mm -hmm. Get too much rain, not enough rain, nothing you can do about it? Mm -hmm. Get a life. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Well, I don't want to end on get a life, but <laughs> <laughs> do you have any final comments or stories or <laughs> you want to? <laughs> no, I, it's been a while. I, I've really enjoyed it. I've, yeah. I've loved what I've done. And, uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, it's been, it's, it's, I've, you know, now, if you say you wouldn't have done things differently, that just shows how ignorant you are. Mm -hmm. Because lots of things I would have done differently. Little, I mean, you know, there's, you know, could you do more of this? Could you do more of that? Could mm -hmm. you tweak stuff? Sure. Mm -hmm. You'd know, be pretty stupid to say, "Oh, I've done everything just the same." Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, I'd have probably done most of the things, yeah, pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, and um, I mean, it's just been a blessing. I mean, you know, to to, and to been recognized as president of the college. Is, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, face it, that's, I mean, that's luck. I mean, you know, really, it's not. I mean, mm -hmm. no matter how hard you work or how good you are or anything else, so much of that's just luck because there's all kinds of people who, who do wonderful things in America mm -hmm. and a lot of great surgeons. And, mm -hmm. and I think one, the, the real thing, and I'll, I'll end on this then, when I was president, I'd visit as many chapters as I could, mm -hmm. and I shook if there were 100 people in the room and I could possibly get to them, I was going to shake 100 hands. Mm -hmm. And that I did. Uh, residents, students, surgeons took some heat for some stuff, got patted on the back for other things, often just for showing up. The mm -hmm. very fact that 
I was only the second person that's ever been to the North Dakota, North Dakota, second South Dakota chapter meeting. Oh wow, yeah. And you know, in all the years, and they had a chapter for sixty years. I was the second president that ever been there. Uh -huh. That's a shame. Yeah. To me, we're got them traipsing all over the world and they can't go to South Dakota. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Yeah. So, so the thing I was struck by though, was the tremendous quality of, of surgical care and people who are involved. I mean, just things that people are doing that we don't hear about every day. The, the, the many wonderful good things that surgeons do for their patients in, in all kinds of ways that we never hear about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm not talking about academic centers. I'm just talking about, I mean, that's, that's true too, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about, you know, the commitment I see of people, you know, 80-year-old guys still in practice in, in, in North Dakota because he's it. Yeah. In a rural, I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a story to, mm -hmm. to be to tell. And, and uh, just the kinds of things that people are doing, the quality of things that people are doing, you just talk to them. And you know they're quality people doing quality work. Mm -hmm. And they're fellows of the college and they're proud of it. So to mm -hmm. me, that's, those are the kinds of things that we really got to cherish and got to, to build on. I think as we, as we as as we go forward and whoever the leaders of the college are in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, great. This has been wonderful. Thank you great. so much thank for you. taking the time. Oh, thank you.